You know, first off, on behalf of Google and the, uh, the Google Veterans Network, uh, a big thanks to, to everyone that came. Um, you know, we're in, a, we're in an interesting company that's full of perks. I will argue that in my personal experience, this Authors At series ranks towards the top. Um, you just look at the flow of just like pure intellectual horsepower that kind of flows through and shares their, their perspective on a topic that they're just, uh, they're just uh, you know, wildly experienced in. And I think it's a, it's, it's a rare opportunity. And so, um, you know, what we're, as I look at what we're going to talk about today and who we're going to talk about it with, this is, again, of the authors at. This even, you know, is, is towards the top of, of my personal list, both in terms of, of, of the person that's communicating the message and, uh, and, the, uh, and, and the topic that we're going to discuss. Um, a few kind of logistical things to start. Um, you know, first off is uh, my you know personal introduction is I'm Ben Boyd. I uh, I work with the uh, the Google Veterans Network here. I'm also in a sales role on the Google for Work team. And um, you know, for those that you know in the room that don't know, and for for those that are going to be be watching later, a little a little intro to what the Google Veterans Network is. Um, you know, Google's a a company that you know is interested in bringing the whole person to work. Um, for, for those that served, a very big part of who you are is, is that experience. And, and today, we are, uh, we're a community of about 1,000 people. Uh, that's split between, between direct veterans and people that are supporters and those that are just interested in, in kind of the topics that get surfaced. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's something that, for those that are involved, um, is, is a huge value add and, and kind of the reach of Google and to, as, a, as a supporter of kind of the, the, the larger veteran efforts is, is something that I think is worth, uh, worth bringing to light here. Um, second, in terms of like structure for today, we're, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna have a bit of a conversation. Um, you know, I wanna, I wanna start real quick by giving you a, a bit of an intro on, on, on Elliot. Um, you know, all I can say is that like it's a it's an absolute privilege, right? Um, our you know Elliot's gonna he's gonna speak on topics that um, that that I think everybody in the room's interested in. This is you know at a surface level, uh, you know it's war. Beyond that, it's it's um, you know it's passion and it's betrayal and it's all of these these sorts of things. Um, but it, you know when you hear a message, it's important to know who's communicating that message. And I think you know, when it comes to, to Elliot's experience, um, it's worth going over a couple of things. Uh, five deployments to, uh, between Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, his, his Iraq deployment was during the, you know, the heaviest fighting that we had in, in Fallujah. His Afghanistan deployment was in, in, on the special operations side in pursuit of the most priority targets that, uh, that, that, that we had in, in that country. Um, and I think that just presence there and participation in that effort is, is worthy of praise, right? But in true form, you're going to see a trend here. Elliot continues to kind of go above and beyond this. Um, Elliot was, has, has a silver star and a bronze star with a V device. And so what that means in civilian speak is that not only has he kind of faced the, uh, the toughest environments and scenarios that, that you're going to find overseas, but he did it in a way that, like, very, you know, that, that supersedes the expectation of how one would, one would deal with them. And I think, you know, what we can pull from that is, one, there is deep expertise when it comes to what life on the ground in, in countries such as Iraq and Afghanistan is. Um, and two, that like, I, I mean, as a country as a whole, we're, 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 in, we're in debt and we're, you know, there's a, there's a deep gratitude for, for that, that sort of background. As he, you know, as he transitioned out of that, I think, you know, Elliot's going to have this brand of just a serial contributor, right? Um, he holds an advanced degree from, uh, from Tufts. He was a white, selected as a White House fellow. He's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. He, uh, he has committed himself to, to writing and his publications and his work uh, is, has been, has appeared in just, I mean, you named the first class publication, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, the Wall Street Journal, to name a few, and, and he's there. And so, um, you know, as you know, as as we transition from from the intro of the person to the intro of, of the book and what we're here to speak of today, um, I think that the green on blue is is if you haven't read it yet, I'll encourage you to to, to pick up a copy as you as you make your exit. But um, you know, the story of a young Afghan orphan who and, and the circumstances of the environment that he's a part of, and this is one that is just uh, in this case in this case uh, a war. Um, 
as a, as a personal veteran, I think there is, you know, what I've noticed as the transition out is that everybody's interested in it, but few have an opportunity to really directly relate. And so we like reach for things that might give you an opportunity to kind of better understand what the environment and the circumstances were. And I think what we have here and what we'll talk to, touch on later and what he'll, he'll read from in a, in a moment is, um, is, is, is just that. So with that said, I, uh, we'll, we'll get to, to, to some talking and let's uh, give him a round of applause and welcome Elliot. So uh, I told him earlier, we, we kinda, we're going to start keeping this light, right? We're going to start with a little bit about, about Elliot as a person, a little bit about Elliot as an author, and then we'll touch on, on the topic in the, in the book today. And so in true Google fashion, I'm going to kind of put him a little bit on the spot here, and we're going to play, uh, play Two Truths and a Lie. <laughs> so I don't know if you're familiar with this, but for those that aren't, we're going to hear three statements from, from Elliot. And I did give him about 30 seconds before we started warning on this, so this is pretty fresh, right? We're going to hear three statements. Two of them are going to be true. One of them is going to be a lie. And then we're going to have Ms. Amy Carl guess as to, uh, to, to which one is, is the lie. Is that fair? Sure. All right. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm forgetting my truths for a moment and my lies. <laughs> uh, OK, so three things. Um, first thing, um, my brother is an Olympic wrestler and a mathematician. OK. Uh, I once ran with the Bulls in Spain. OK. And my father used to race Formula Ford race cars. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, pretend like it's uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. <laughs> I'm, I'm no. gonna get the audience to vote. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I'll see how I feel about their vote. Okay, so if it's, if, who thinks that the brother wrestler mathematician is the lie? You think that, okay. Who thinks the running with the bulls in Spain is a lie? And, uh, and who thinks the NASCAR racing, or I'm sorry, for, who is almost offensive. <laughs> <laughs> Formula One. I'm from, thing, Ohio. Right? I'm from Ohio, right? <laughs> All car racing is NASCAR. Um, Wait, some of you voted twice. You think I'm telling two lies? <laughs> <laughs> what do you got, Amy? Okay, I actually am also going to go with the bull racing as as the lie. Uh, no, I ran with the bulls. Did. Okay. Yeah, right when I got back from Iraq. I would have guessed Formula 4 because I don't know what a Formula 4 is. What's the difference Formula between four, one and it's, four? It's is it one, just a motor? It's one right, okay. it's one right beneath. And that's right. actually the lie. My father was obsessed with race car driving, yeah. but he never actually, never actually drove. So um, when I was younger, the one day that we didn't, the one Sunday when we never went to church was when the Indy 500 was on. I did <laughs> I didn't ah, love that. it. You know, and, and on that topic, I'd love to, again, kind of understand a little bit more about you. So we've talked about father. We've talked about the truth that is a, a brother that is an Olympic wrestler and a mathematician. Yeah. Uh, you build a little bit more on, on, on your background and, and tell sure. me a little bit about those. You know, what makes it unique and what were those influences on, on you? Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I mean, I come from a family that's, uh, you know, I have one brother who's two years older. Okay. Um, you know, we were always pretty tight growing up. My mother is a novelist, so okay. uh, so I grew up around books. In your blood a little? Yeah, mm -hmm. studied, um, studied history and literature at university. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I do have this, I have this very eclectic brother who is a goodwill hunting, smart mathematician, I mean, who literally, when I was three years old in the back of the Volvo, you know, picking my nose and banging my G.I. Joes together, he was five. Saying, you know, Dad, if X equals three, and Y is unknown, I mean, just in his blood. Um, wow. And and he was a gifted wrestler and wrestled in 2004 in Athens. Okay. Um, so you know, that's that's my my family background at okay. least. Um, but no, and no, no military in my family. No I'm military. The only one. Uh, I understand there was a lot of overseas time when you were young as well. Yeah, there was. So when I was nine years old, I, I was born in Los Angeles and lived there till I was nine, and then in a dramatic climactic switch or climate switch, uh, we moved from, from Los For Angeles to London. That moved climactic and, yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah right? it was climactic as well. But, um, but I have vivid memories of, you know, at week number two of not seeing the sun, asking when the hell I was going to get out of this place. Okay. Um, then it wound up being six years, so I stayed there till I was uh, 15 and then finished up high school in the States. Okay. What does that what does that do for you, right? So what kind of diversity does that kind of contribute? So I mean, traditionally you come from a fairly, you know, most of us, myself included, come from, you know, more or less a cookie cutter kind of, you know, uh, American American existence. Yeah. What but then you go to high you college and that's where you start developing a little mm -hmm. bit more deeper personality. What do you think? Yeah, well, I think I mean I think some of it kind of starts to get into the themes of, you know, like what drew me into the service. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 
London is not that much different. I mean, if you want to go like one culture over, it's about the closest you can right, obviously get true. to being an American, uh, aside from going to Canada, um, and that's up for debate. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, and I think about it a lot now, because yeah. I, I live in Istanbul, so I'm raising, I have two small children. You know, we have been raising them in, Ist in, you know, in Istanbul, which is obviously, especially with everything that's going on right now, pretty, uh, you know, a pretty dramatic shift from life on the East Coast where we were before. But I think as a young person living in London, what was great was it, you know, it allowed, it allowed me to travel, mm -hmm. you know, widely through Europe, I think, which just gave me enough of a slant view on what it means to be an American um, to, yeah. you know, to, to kind of start to inspire a bit of a, an appreciation. I think going into college, I always, you know, I felt and was and am you know, fortunate son of this country. I came from a good family. I got to go to Tufts University, a great school. And, um, you know, I, I went and did ROTC in 1998. And uh, so it was before 9-11. But, you know, I just sort of had this sense that, you know, when I got out, I wanted a job or whether I was good at my job or bad at my job, you know, really, really mattered. And, uh, and I wanted a lot of responsibility young. And I couldn't think of anywhere else where at 23 years old, they put me in charge of 45 people. You know, that's what I got in the Marines as an infantry platoon commander. Um, and so, you know, that coupled with just sort of a visceral sense of, you know, feeling, um, you know, feeling like I should and, and was somewhat almost obligated to give something back, you know, led me, led me into the Marines. Um, but I had, you know, sitting there in 1998, joining the ROTC, mm -hmm. you know, I sort of had no idea what the next decade would hold. Like you gave me a very nice introduction. My mother just says, this is my son, Elliot. He's like the Forrest Gump of the last 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think there's an interesting point there, right? So, so 1998 is business as usual in the service, yeah. right? And so 2001 strikes, you graduate college. I understand you had a, a uh, you got your advanced degree in a compressed schedule. So in five years. Right. So talk to me about like what the, what the, the world was as you were starting your, your Marine Corps career. Sure. I mean, I mean, I remember viscerally when 9-11 happened, and I was about a year out from from potentially graduating college. Although I wound up doing a dual bachelor's master's degree, I remember you know going into the RO to my my senior ROTC instructor and saying, you know, I'm thinking about just leaving school early, kind of very dramatically, and you know, him being like, you know, sit down with for snap for this thing's going to go on for a long time. You yeah. should probably get your college degree, but. Um, you know, those first two years, I mean, you know, there was sort of a slow sea change taking place. And I remember reporting down to Quantico, to the basic school where Marine officers go through training, and it was uh, June of 2003, and the vibe there was very much, you know, this sense of, like the, like, the, like the Persian Gulf War had just happened, and it's like, and the captains who are instructors sort of being like, well, hey guys, you know, you all just missed the war, you know, we just missed it too, um, you know, so sad, too bad, you know, we gotta get down to training. And I remember over that summer, slowly, these sort of more, you know, these first lieutenants who were kind of the, you know, this, the junior officers who'd been in the invasion, they had just started trickling back because they were gonna now become captains and instructors themselves. And then in August, I remember there, August of 2003, there was this headline in the Marine Times, and it was headlines, Marines back to Iraq. And when we saw this, everyone, I mean, including the captains was like, what are we gonna be doing in Iraq? I mean, for shock troops, this is occupation duty, the war is over, into that winter and then in the spring, and I was finishing my infantry officer training in the spring when uh, the contractors were hung from the bridge in, uh, you know, in Fallujah, mm -hmm. and uh, within a week, sort of all hell was breaking loose. An officer from the class before us was killed. One of my buddies had to go as a combat replacement. Okay. And it was just very quick rotation within a couple months of this idea that you know, we were all going to war, and those of us who were going to Iraq weren't going for occupation duty. I mean, we were, we were going to fight. Um, so I definitely do remember that quick kind of shift, which I think was a little bit unique to that time, because I think that in subsequent years, we really bore down. Mm -hmm. and I think as we were talking a little bit, you know, by 2005, 2006, 2007, I mean, these wars were going, and everybody knew they were going to war. Right. But for us, it was actually a little bit of a process of a realization, like, wow, I guess we're, I guess we're going to war. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I'll, uh, you know, I'll ask the, the general question, right, uh, of, of, you know, tell us about, you know, I want to hear about mm -hmm. Elliot the Marine, right? And I want to mm -hmm. hear about, I mean, we've, we've read the bio and we know that these, these Valorous Awards are, are not something that are, are just given out. You know, tell us about just, you know, those, at a, at a high level, those experiences and kind of the impact that they've had on, on, on you as in, in the development as, as a person there. Well, you know, I think... Um you know, I have a very good friend of mine who's sort of always acted like he's a Marine Corps big brother to me, and he's been in special operations for a long time. I mean, he's got more deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan than I can count on both of my hands. I mean, you know, wow. legitimately. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and he still works in, in, that, in those realms. And so one of the ways we keep up is uh, he's a big runner, so, and he 
doesn't like to sleep. So, you know, he'll be like, yeah, meet me at five in the morning, we'll go for a nice run. So I, you know, we're buddies, so I get out of bed. You know, I remember about probably, you know, six months ago, yeah. I was in the States and we were meeting up for a run and we were sort of hoofing our way up this hill and uh, just sort of had been reminiscing about the war at a very macro level. Talking about ideas like PTSD, do I have it, do yeah. you have it, who knows? Yeah. Um, you know, what is it, what did it all mean? And at a certain point he like looked over at me and he said, you know, he said, you know, Elliot, he's like, the melancholy of it all is that we grew up there. Yeah, and I thought a lot about that. It's like, we did grow up there. You know, I left, you know, for my first combat deployment, I guess I was 24. I came back on my last one, I was 31. You know, that was sort of the years where, you know, you kind of grow up and of become course. like the adult you're gonna be. Yeah. So something that's fascinating me too, though, is so as much as, you know, me and my buddy and so many others have been completely defined by these experiences, when you start reflecting on it, you, know, you realize there's a whole, another side of that coin and that the whole time you're having these experiences you know you're very much engaged in this sort of shadow dance with your adversary and so i mean i know intellectually uh, and again it's something i'm very interested in my writing that that shadow dance has been going on with you know iraqis with afghans and for every one of us there's just as many of them who have been exactly so defined and being so defined you know in many respects i have more in common with them you know than many of the people that i've come home with too and like and what does that mean um, so, you know, like Yeats has this great poem uh, mm. around the First World War. It's called An Irish Airman Foresees His Death. Uh, and the poem opens, um, you know, I know that I shall meet my fate somewhere amongst the clouds above. Those that I fight, I do not hate. Those that I guard, I do not love. Uh, nor law nor duty bade me fight, nor public men nor cheering crowds. But a lonely impulse of delight drove me to this tumult in the clouds. And so to me, that poem has always been a little bit about kind of that idea of, you know, what are those things that drive us to conflict? Like, what is that lonely impulse of delight that so many of us feel, whether or not we're American, Iraqi, Afghan, mm -hmm. Syrian, like what perpetuates these wars? Um, and, you know, I, I do a lot of thinking about that. I wrote, um, I did a piece, I guess it was about a year ago, um, so I do a lot of writing on the Syrian civil war now. And I travel down there with a couple of friends of mine who started basically a research company that they bid on government contracts and NGO contracts um, down in a city called Gaziantep, which is, you know, 40, it's in Turkey, but it's a 45 minute drive from Aleppo. And, um, and one of the fellows who's working for them is this guy named Abed, who was a Syrian activist during the revolution's early days. Um, and to give you just a, a picture, Abed is the grand nephew of, of uh, Nizar Kabani, a famous poet laureate of Syria who died in exile in London. He, before the revolution, worked at the British consulate, speaks English with a perfect British accent, you know, makes me sound like gutter trash. Right. And um, one day Abed came back and he'd been basically doing interviews in this place called the Chakale, which is a refugee camp 500 meters from Syria, where, you know, sometimes they take incoming artillery. Mm -hmm. And he sat there with me, you know, we were sitting down, kind of eating dinner, drinking tea, and he's like, Elliot, I was in a chocolate today. And he's like, and I, I don't know, I met this fellow and I think the two of you should meet. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll be like, well, who's, who's the guy, what's the deal? He's like, well, he used to fight for Al Qaeda in Iraq. He's like, but, but, but bear with me. <laughs> like, I think the two of you would really get along. And so, okay, so we talked about it. And yeah, and basically the idea was, you know, like I would go meet this guy hmm. and, uh, and do a story that was basically, you know, two vets from the Iraq war sit down and have lunch, but we fought on different sides of the war. Hmm. And, um, and then talking to Abed, it was sort of this idea of, well, you know, how, well, how are we gonna meet him? Like, you know, I mean, we can't really just tell him that I was a Marine. Right. And this, guy was, this guy was still an Islamist at the time, you know, at the, and at the, at the time uh, had some affiliations to Jabhat al-Nusra, a big fighting group there. Okay. Yeah. And so, so then anyways, the first line of the story was, Abed and I agreed the night before we'd lie and tell him I'd been a journalist. Um, and that was what we told him. But within about half an hour of sitting down and he was sort of telling me about fighting, you know, we, I, I felt like there was a real sort of, um, we were very simpatico with one another. Mm. And I kind of dropped, you know, dropped my normal card. I was like, hey, listen, his name was Abu Sarm. I'm like, you know, I wasn't really there as a journalist. I was there as a Marine. And he kind of looked at me and smiled. And then we, you know, kept talking. And it turned into a six hour lunch. Um, and and, I'll, and, I'll, and then I'll, I'll just relay this and then I'll finish. And for me, one of the most poignant points of that lunch was Abed had been translating between us the entire time as we were talking, drinking tea, eating baklava. Um, sort of reminiscing about our wars and what they meant to us. And then after about three hours, you know, good old Abed, he's like, listen, I gotta, I gotta go to the bathroom. So, you know, all this tea. So he gets up to go to the bathroom and now Abu Hassar and I are sitting there, the two of us, and we've had this like very intense conversation for three hours and now we're sitting there like, you know, two teenagers on their first date, like we can't talk, everything's really awkward all of a sudden. 
And so I had my notebook where I was, you know, scribbling down our conversation. And, you know, it's my idea. I sort of took a squiggly line and basically traced out on a page the Euphrates River. And he kind of saw what I was doing, and then he traced out this sharp, um, tangential border between Iraq and Syria because he had run guns and fighters across the border. It's one of his responsibilities. And we started writing in, I started writing in the names of places. Uh, and he could sort of see where they were at on the map. And then he kind of took the pen from me and started writing in the dates. And our sort of hands were chasing each other around the nap, you know, as, mm. as I reflect, kind of much the way we chased each other around the country years ago. You know, and the only thing, the only thing that we could communicate without an interpreter was the place names and the dates. And we wrote those dates down to see if we'd fought in the same place at the same time uh, and, and hadn't, so. Interesting. Yeah. I want to I wanna transition, and I want to transition to, uh, you know, we've talked about, about the, the upbringing and then the service experience, and let's talk about you as an author a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so you transition out of the service. You, uh, you've got a stint as a White House fellow. Um, I'm sure you're writing throughout. What mm -hmm. was that kind of conversation? What was that decision point that said, "Hey, this is me. I want to go. I want to go all in." Sure. You know, I. I mean, I always knew that I was going to write. Um, again, it was something that I grew up around. Um, you know, even from early days in the service, I felt like you know I'm likely going to write something about this someday. But I could never really get at the material. I mean, it was still going on. I didn't have any type of feeling of uh, of closure with it. And actually, my last deployment in Afghanistan in 2011, I'd made the decision that I was going to come home. I mean, it almost sounds, sounds trite to frame it in this way, but literally two days later, I started writing the first scene mm -hmm. that, I ever, that I ever really kind of took, sort of, you know, fictionalizing what I thought would be the beginnings of a story. Um, and that was two days. So for me, it was actually, I didn't know what would enable the writing to begin, but it was this hard decision I made that you know, like the war is over for me now. Okay. And once I made that decision, I think I had the mental space to start trying to, you know, to render it, I mean, and other things in fiction. But I think even if I hadn't been writing about the war, mm -hmm. you know, if I'd been writing about, you know, you know, guys hanging out in Brooklyn or whatever, right. you know, I wouldn't have been able to do while I was in the military. My, my emotional space was too occupied by that experience. What is some of the process of writing? I see you're in Istanbul. I see like a, a balcony over the Bosporus and, and, and a cup of chai. I mean, is this something that is like just consumes you? Are you a, um, are you a like lock yourself in a room and write or slow and steady sort of approach here? Uh, well, I'm definitely like cup of chai. Looking at the Bosporus is okay. always nice if you, can, <laughs> right. if you can figure that out. Um, you know, I, I think everyone has a different process. Yeah. You know, for me, I'm, once I have an idea, I'm definitely kind of a grinder. It's probably the, you know, it's probably the military side of me. But you know, if I'm working on a new project and I sort of, and it's going well and I know where it's going, you know, I write yeah. about a thousand words a day. That's okay. kind of what I try to hit. And then if I'm revising, I sort of set intermediate goal, intermediary goals. I'm gonna revise these 30 pages today. And um, you know, again, you have to sort of have, the, have a lead on something that you're working on. But for me, it's very much, I don't sort of work in spurts of, inf you know, of inspiration. Yeah. I actually know a few successful writers who do. Most will tell you. I mean, okay. it, it, it's very workmanlike. Bit of I mean, a grind, huh? Bit of a grind. And, you know, and when you're getting to the end and, you know, you're sitting there with a the manuscript, I mean, when I'm at the final stages of the manuscript, I lock myself in a room, a quiet room, and I read it out loud to myself mm -hmm. with a pencil, mm -hmm. you know, and I do that multiple times to sort of get the, you know, the, the rhythm right, the sentences right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's Any, it's any a mentors slog. that kind of stick out to you here? Sure. I've had, I mean, I've had great mentors. Um, you know, my mother who's yeah, a novelist. Of I mean, you know, I remember from a very young age sitting on her sofa as she sort of tore apart my, you know, sixth grade papers. But, you know, that matters. <laughs> yeah. uh, teachers matter. You know, I had a couple of phenomenal English teachers in high school. And then, you know, later on, you know, as you surround yourself with, you know, with other writers who, you know, who inspire you. When I was in college, um, my, f my freshman creative writing teacher was uh, Andre Debus, who wrote The House of Sand and Fog. Okay. If you're familiar with that book, it was made into a film. Um, you know, I remember him, he was actually finishing that novel when he was sort of adjuncting at Tufts mm -hmm. and working carpentry jobs at the, on the side. I remember he would come in, you know, just exhausted, you know, I mean, sawdust still on his jeans. I'm like, All right, well, what are we talking about today, guys? And, right. you know, and then like two years later, he was sort of this internationally acclaimed author with a movie. Right. And it was, for me, it was always fun to just know that I had a, you know, a window of him mm -hmm. when he was working hard. Because, you know, because so much of it is, I mean, it's a struggle. It's a lot yeah. of struggle, um, you know, as you're, you know, as you're, working through your material and trying to get it out there in the world. Okay. Yeah. Well, great. I, I want to I wanna give enough time to, to talk a green, on, green on blue. So maybe I can just kind of pass it to you for a few minutes and maybe an intro to the idea in the sure. book. And then I would love to, to hear a passage if you're willing to share. 
Sure. Well, I mean, the, the, the title green on blue refers to the uh, insider attacks in Afghanistan. So green is sort of military short speak for friendly troops, i.e. the Afghan soldiers, and blue for American soldiers. So a green on blue attack is when an Afghan soldier uh, takes his weapon and you know, shoots his advisor, and we've seen that as a trend. But in the novel, it really sort of acts as a metaphor, this idea of you know, what happens when the cause that you fight for threatens to destroy you. Um, so I'm just going to read just from the beginning so you guys can get a sense for what the book feels like, and this is basically the opening page. Many would call me a dishonest man, but I've always kept faith with myself. There is an honesty in that, I think. I am Ali's brother. We are from a village that no longer exists, and our family was not large or prosperous. The war that came after the Russians, but before the Americans, killed our parents. Of them, I have only dim memories. There is my father's Kalishnikov, hidden in a woodpile by the door him cleaning it, working oiled rags on its parts, and the smell of gunmetal, and feeling safe. There is my mother's secret, the one she shared with me. Once a month she'd count out my father's earnings from fighting in the mountains or farming. She'd send me and Ali from our village, Sperkai, to the large bazaar in Orgun, a two-day walk. The Orgun bazaar sold everything, fine cooking oils and spices, candles to light our home and fabrics to repair our clothes. My mother always entrusted me with a special purchase. Before we left, she would press an extra coin in my hand, one she'd stolen from my father. Among the crowded stalls of the bazaar, I would slip away from my brother's watchful eye and buy her a pack of cigarettes, a vice forbidden to a woman. When we returned home, I would place the pack in her hiding spot, the birchwood cradle where she'd rocked Ali and me as infants. Our mud-walled house was small, two thatch-roofed rooms with a courtyard between them. The cradle was kept in the room I shared with Ali. My mother would never get rid of the cradle. It was the one thing that was truly hers. At night, after we returned from the bazaar, she'd sneak into our room, her small, sandaled feet gliding across the carpets that lined the dirt floor. Her hand would cup a candle, its smothered light casting shadows on her young face, aging her. Her eyes, one brown and the other green, a miracle or defect of birth, shifted about the room. Carefully she would lean over the cradle as she'd done before taking us to nurse. She would run her fingers between the blankets that once swaddled my brother and me, and, finding the pack I'd left her, she'd step into the courtyard and I'd fall back asleep to the faint smell of her tobacco just past my door. This secret made me feel close to my mother. In the years since, I've wondered why she entrusted me with it. At times, I've thought it was because I was her favorite. But this isn't why. The truth is, she recognized in me her own ability to deceive. So, you know, that's the, that's the opening of the novel. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, the whole book is told in the first person from the perspective of Aziz, who you hear there. Um, who's a, this is him as a young Afghan boy. And the trajectory of the novel basically follows him as he goes off to fight uh, with an Afghan militia. You know, I mean, it's always difficult to sort of say where a book begins because so much of the process of writing a novel is you're really groping in the dark for, you know, for the story. So oftentimes what starts as the beginning winds up as the middle, the middle winds up as the end, the end winds up as the beginning. <laughs> but, um, you know, for me in writing the book too, you know, there's sort of like... I'll just share an anecdote that I will keep coming back to. Um, you know, as been mentioned, when I was in Afghanistan, I served exclusively in special operations and, and as an advisor to Afghan troops. So in many respects, you know, my war buddies were a few Americans, but many of them were Afghans. So these weren't guys that I, when the war was over, you know, would, would early ever see again. But we'd done all the things people have always done when they fight together. You know, we'd fought together, mourned friends together, we'd bled together. But trapped as they were in that country's elliptical conflict, they weren't a bunch of guys I could, you know, friend on Facebook, um, go get beers with at the local VFW for a quarter, or call long distance. So really for me, the novel was an effort to render their world kind of as a, as a last act of friendship. And for me, it was also a way to reckon with the loss of that friendship. Um, but when I think about kind of, you know, what that war was like, you know, I have to come back to this one story, uh, which was, you know, one of the guys I advised was this guy named uh, Isak. And Isak was this, uh, you know, Tajik tribal guy in Paktika province, which is right on the border with South Waziristan and Pakistan, really sort of remote, a remote bad place. Isak had worked here for about 10 years. 
And uh, you know, we lived on a fire base that was basically about three football fields mm -hmm. uh, up in the high desert. Right. And about once every two weeks, you know, we would have what was very grandly termed our operational planning meeting. But what it really re involved was me sort of bebopping across the fire base into Esoc's little hooch, which was this sort of plywood hut. And I'd walk into his hooch, and in his hooch there'd be, he had, the, I remember he had this lumpy sofa in the corner um, that he was always sort of reclining on, and I would kind of flop down next to him on the lumpy sofa. There'd be a little plywood table in front of us, and he'd go to his dresser, and he'd pull out a pack of smokes, get a pot of chai, sit it on the dresser, and we'd sit back, the two of us kind of leaning there, and we'd look up at the far wall, and on the far wall there were two things. There was a map, and there was a calendar. So Isak would, you know, sort of cigarette in hand, would get up to the map, and he'd look at it, and he'd say, you know, I'd say, all right, Isak, you know, what do you think we should do for the next couple weeks? And looking at the map, he would sort of sit there and, you know, he'd look up at one of the villages right on the border and he'd say, you know, well, you know, Mr. Elliot, we could go up to Rara Kure. You know, there's always very good hunting up in Rara Kure. So I'd say, all right, you know, we'd get in the trucks, load them up, you know, 12 vehicles, about 120, 130 Afghans. We'd drive up to Rara Kure over a couple of days. You know, 50-50 chance we would get into a gunfight up there. We'd come back down, we would, you know, clean up the trucks for a day, fix them up, give the guys a day off. Inevitably, I would come back in for the operational planning meeting. Two weeks would have passed. I'd sit down on the lumpy sofa with Isak. Same thing, you know, pack of smokes, pot of chai, Isak up at the map. I'd be like, all right, Isak. Hey, it was a great op up in Rara Kure. You know, uh, you know what, are you, what are you thinking about next? I mean, you know the ground better than anyone. You've been here 10 years. And he'd look at the map, stroke his chin and say, well, next village south. You know, Mr. Elliot, we could go to Mangrate. It's always very good hunting in Mangrate. We do the same thing, load up the trucks, head up to Mangrate. And you know, the conversation between us was never one where it was like, you know, Mr. Elliot, if we go to Rara Kure, then we hit them in Mangrate, we can one, run one last operation in Malakshe, seal the border, seal the border shut, the war will be over, I can go back to my crops, you can go get your Master of Fine Arts, you know, write that novel you keep talking about. Like, it just, like, it was not that type of war. You know, so what type of war was it? Mm -hmm. You know, for me, one of the ambitions of the novel is to try to show that paradigm that existed in Afghanistan. The one that existed for Isak, that kept his war being fought for every reason but the ending of it. You know, for a war that's been going on for 30 years. You know, but also the paradigm for us, that's kept us at war for 15 years. Because as much as Isak was going village to village and had, in many respects, more, more in common with a beat cop than with like a General Eisenhower figure, you know, sort of so did I in a lot of ways. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't sitting there saying, hey, Isak, how are we gonna win the war in Pictika province? You know, I at that point was a guy who, you know, worked in special operations, had been doing this work for years, it's what defined me. I wanted to be on the deployments where, you know, sort of the action was thickest, that assured my promotion. Okay. Um, and that was sort of my incentive structure. Mm. So, um, so for me, you know, a real ambition of the book is to try to, to show that as truly as I could. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, let the reader determine what they think of it. You know, part of what I, I pulled out was, you know, you, and, and you alluded to in the, in the book, where you superimpose this American way of life and its mm -hmm. timeline and its discipline and its these results, X results by, you know, by, by Y date. Mm -hmm. And then you, you drop that on top of this kind of beat cop mentality and this mm -hmm. very low level like way of life approach to it as opposed to let's, let's get something we can, we can tag as a win and, and depart. Um, I'd love to know what kind of on a couple of different levels maybe, and we'll start with, the American citizens' interpretation of the uh, of, of the Afghan community and population and partner mm -hmm. network. I would love to uh, to hear your thoughts on what you hope the American citizen can pull out of this after reading, in terms of their their understanding of of, of the Afghan community. Yeah, you know, again, I I hope that it sort of is able to render the war as the Afghans saw. It. You know. Mm -hmm. You know, as I mentioned, people behave according to their incentive structure. So yeah. for a fellow like Isak, if the war ended, it wouldn't actually be great for Isak. Mm -hmm. All of his stature was derived um, by his position in his tribe, in his community, as the head of one of these militias. So in many respects, everything I saw is that you know, wars build, their economies build out around wars. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily mean like financial economies exclusively, although that can often be part of it, um, but economies in terms of where people stand socially, people's careers, and they build out on both sides. And I think for us, you know, one of the things I'm hoping that, you know, a reader might take away from the book, you know, and I think, you know, in fiction and through story, you know, oftentimes, you know, it's, uh, I don't find, I don't think good work necessarily provides pedantic answers. I think it just frames questions in ways that are honest and gives the reader enough generous space to, to start asking themselves those questions. So the questions, I think in many respects, one of the questions the book gets at is, you know, 
why does a war go on for 30 years? Why does it go on for 15 years? You know, why, you know, why are these wars, do they go on in a way, and why are they being fought for every reason but the ending of them? You know, is that because we just can't get to that final, you know, mm -hmm peace treaty where we've achieved our objectives, or is it because these wars are trying to feed themselves? And if they are trying to feed themselves, what is the economy that's creating that? And just trying to show that. And in many respects, the paradigm that exists yeah. in the book is one I saw play out you know, in Afghanistan many times over in different, you know, in different provinces, villages, districts. Interesting. Have you, have you shared it with any Afghans? Yeah, I, I mean, I had a f you know, few of my readers who were Afghans, uh, folks I knew in Kabul, who, yeah. you know, who were checking it. Um, you know, there's a lot of Afghan slang in it to sort of make sure that I had gotten that all right, Pashto slang. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are folks who, frankly, their English is not as a level where they're like really appreciating literary fiction. They can kind of get by on it. Um, so, you know, I would say the, f I mean, the first Afghan reader who read it, who was someone who was a, a literary person, was Khalid Husseini, who read it uh, yeah. know, to blurb it. So, uh -huh. we were glad when he liked the book. <laughs> um, Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in kind of on this topic of feedback that you've had since. Do you mm -hmm. feel like you have accomplished the objectives that you set out to in terms of just posing those tough questions? Do you feel like in retrospect you would course correct in any way? You mean like rewrite the book? In, in, <laughs> in terms of kind of how you're, yeah, in terms of really getting at how you would, how would you pull those Yeah, those I mean, no, I mean, you know, I sort of hate to, you know, to frame it in terms of like, like of there's an objective to be achieved. Because, right. I mean, you know, it's art, like okay. you're telling a story. Um, you know, if people read the book and they feel something, that's all I care about. You know, I mean, in so, in so many ways, I think one of the things that's interesting about writing, a, you know, a novel in particular, because it's very much rooted in the emotional, is you've had this incredibly, you know, I've had a very intimate experience with that book for a long time. For a long, long time, it was a thing that I would hold like this. And only the closest people were allowed to read it as it was in draft and give me their opinions. You know, and I had to really think about all of those opinions and how I would incorporate them into the story or whether they merited being incorporated in the story. And then the book comes out and you throw it out to the world and everybody can read it and everybody can have their opinion. And people yeah. see things in the book that you didn't even know were in the book. Mm -hmm. And it makes you think about, you know, because so much of these stories get written by your subconscious. Um, so, you know, again, I don't know if there's, you know, if there's an objective. I think the objective of all art is to basically transfer your emotion into another person through some type of medium, whether it's visual or through story. And so if somebody reads the book and they feel something, then, you know, then that's a good thing. That's great. That's great. We, um, you know, we as a, as a society, I think this is one of the many outlets that we have to, uh, to kind of hear this, the, the, the message of specifically kind of these global war and terror efforts, right? I think the one that we just consume at the quicker pace is a lot of the Hollywood renditions. And I think mm -hmm. this year, especially uh, for, you know, until recently, the leading box office was, uh, you know, in terms of, in terms of sales was the uh, American Sniper. And then we mm -hmm. had Lone Survivor before that. Can you tell us a little bit about your, you know, share some thoughts in terms of how good of a job those are communicating and what messages they're passing on? Um, well, it's a lot of seals. <laughs> If there ever was a marketing effort to be had from the yeah, military I mean, community, do what the SEALs do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah they, seem to, they seem to have nailed that. Um, yeah, I mean, without getting into, like, the relative sort of, you know, which one I think is good, which of one course. I didn't like, yeah, which no, one, of course. you know, I walked out of. Uh -huh. um, um, I think it's a good thing that these movies are, the fact that these movies are doing well yeah. shows that there is, I think, an appetite in the country for people to reflect back on these wars and what they meant and okay. to try to understand what they meant. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah. I'm glad, mm -hmm. you know? So, what would you um, caution a viewer? What would you, what would you tell the, somebody going in that might w have that thirst and that interest in, in understanding but not have a, a direct relationship? Well, I think it? sometimes it's the undercurrent is kind of like the, you know, well, is, you know, is that what it was like? You know, is this American Sniper what it was like? Yeah. Is this what it's, I mean, no one can tell you what it's like um, right. because it's, yeah. everyone's, everyone's experience in the wars has been very, very different. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I, you know I, I had a, a very diverse uh, military experience from being in Iraq to being in Afghanistan to being in different parts of Afghanistan. Okay. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm just very leery of someone who feels like they have the true experience. You know, every, everyone's, everyone has a, you know, has a right to their experience. Okay. So I want to, I want to give the audience an opportunity to, uh, to participate. We have a mic. Um, but yeah, I want to, so based off the discussion, we'd love to hear maybe some, some thoughts and some things we'd like to, to hear. 
My name is Mike. Uh, interested in hearing a little bit about your transition. It looks like it was a kind of a model successful transition and what advice you have for the flood of new veterans and, and people getting out of the military right now. Um, sure, thanks. Um, I don't know if it was a model transition. I think it's like it's, you know, everybody struggles, I think, when you get out to figure out what the next thing is going to be once you are leaving and, um, you know, and how you're going to basically repurpose yourself because I think for anybody, right, where we often derive our happiness is from what we feel is our, you know, our purpose in life and whether that's defined as, you know, I, as simply as I work a job and that job or as conventionally as I work a job, that job puts food on the table, my kids get to go to school, you know, they get opportunities because of that, you know, that's a good purpose. I think something that can be a challenge for vets is that, you know, for those of us who've gone and served, and particularly in the wars, you know, you come out and you're maybe 20 years old, you go right into the war, like it's a very intense purpose. You're surrounded by your best friends, um, you know, you have an objective that, you know, can oftentimes see at least somewhat clear uh, at face value, you know, hold an outpost from patrols here. So coming back, and I think repurposing yourself can sometimes feel disorienting, um, but it's what, you know, we sort of have to do. It's kind of like the last, you know, the last steps or the last mission is figuring out what that purpose is going to be that carries you on into your life. Um, you know, and for me, it's, you know, for me, it's writing. Um, and I think that one thing it seems this generation of vets is doing a good job amongst each other with is sort of being the support network that's helping, you know, e you know, that's helping each other kind of achieve that last purpose, you know, that, that final sense of purpose. So, you know, I don't know. I, I feel very lucky to be part of this generation of vets. Like, we seem to be a pretty good group. I think it's a good question, and I think it's one that we discuss and we've really tried to prioritize as a, as, as a veterans network internal to Google. We, uh, you know, we, we certainly dabble and try to have a positive influence in some of the recruiting efforts and, and some internal things, but I think a big part of what we do is just the support of the mm -hmm. external community. Uh, we do, you know, once a year, our, kind of our, our, our big bang is, uh, you know, 20 plus offices throughout the country. We do a help a hero get hired event. Yeah. So we bring a bunch of folks that have trans recently transitioned. Uh, we sit them down. We help them kind of translate the resume of what they did in the service to what can be mm -hmm. read and understood and digested from a uh, potential hiring you yeah. know, s position. Would love to, you know, on that kind of topic of, of advice for somebody that's trying to really like package what they, what they did and when the tangible skill sets might not be directly transferable, you know, what's your, what's your advice in helping people think through, um, you know, what they can do to, to communicate their value? I, you know, I don't know if I have any neat advice this, uh, you know, aside from you know, have, a, have a personal narrative of kind of what your experience was, what it was to you, mm -hmm. you know, who you are as a person, yeah. and kind of and be able to tell that story with a, you know, with a certain level of consistency yeah. I think helps because, yeah, I can imagine some of those things don't necessarily, if you were you know, an infantry squad leader, right. you know, the level of responsibility you've had might not necessarily translate mm -hmm. uh, across the pages easily. But, you know, but hopefully, too, I would tell someone you know, to try to plug in with other vets because right. um, no one's going to take care, no one's going to take care of vets better than other vets. Right. And so if you can be at least getting your entry level experience at a place where, where some of that you know, is is understood, mm -hmm. you know, I, I would look for those opportunities. Yeah, and, and hi, like you said, highlighting that core competency, you know, you can't, you can't train that discipline and that work ethic and all those sorts of things that just kind of come with somebody that has earned the position of squad leader in an infantry, an infantry yeah. platoon, right? Yeah. I think there's something to be said for that. Um, Elliot, nice to meet you. My name is Will. Um, I haven't served, and, um, but I have family members and friends that have. If you, um, if you had the microphone at our company-wide meeting later this afternoon that's broadcast to 50,000 Googlers across the world. I'm curious, what would be the, the two or three things that you would want people that live in a relatively comfortable environment, as you can see here, to, to think about whether it's about the experience you had or misperceptions that 99% of the country has who's not enlisted or mm -hmm. issues with Veterans Affairs, but what would be the two or three bullet points that you would want to communicate to a, a wide audience? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I think a couple of bullet points I would I would communicate about these wars is um, and the experience of them is, you know, every time the U.S. has gone to war, it's been under a certain construct. So the Second World War was a national mobilization funded by war bonds. Um, the Vietnam War was a war typified by sort of you know the draft and conscription. These wars have been fought with an all-volunteer military and funded largely through deficit spending. And that, con that construct we put in place has made it so, unless you are in the military, you don't really feel the war. 
and it's led to a system where we have wars that can perpetuate. You know, there's a discussion right now, a debate you know, about whether or not we're going to be putting troops in back into Iraq to fight ISIS. And for most people, it's a debate that's completely ancillary to their personal lives because, you know, if you're not affiliated with the military, you, know, you, you don't have to feel that pain. Um, and I don't know, if that's the new framework, we're probably going to have wars that go on a lot longer. We probably won't feel the wars in the same way. Is that the country type of country we want to live in? Is that how we think we want to be projecting ourselves abroad? Uh, I'm not going to sit here and claim to necessarily have that answer, but I think it's something that's going on beneath the surface that you know, many Americans might not be recognizing is how, is how we've sort of transformed. And, uh, you know, and how we project force says a lot about us as a country, and it's a conversation I think that's worth having. So I don't know if that was two or three sharp PowerPoint bullets, but it's something I think about a lot. Well, we can get two more before the meeting this okay. afternoon. Okay, so. good. Well, right. yeah, you let me know. All right. Um, well, great. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of pose the final question and, and open it back up to you to, uh, to cover anything that you, uh, you think we might not have touched on that you think the, uh, you know, the, the book could be a good vehicle to, to, to communicate. Oh, I hate that question. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, and what, high fastballs. That's, yeah, what we're, that's what we're throwing. Well, yeah, what, days, we right? haven't, what we yeah. haven't talked about. Um, you know, I believe in books. I think, I think books matter. Um, I think as much as you know, every you know, the world has gone more to YouTube and has gone uh -huh. to film and has gone to other things. I think that books matter, and I think that um, I think there's a lot of great literature that has come out about these wars, uh, and that I know is coming out on the horizon. And you know, I hope people I hope people read it, and I you know, and I feel like they are, and I think okay. that's a and I think that's a good thing, um, and uh, and that's happened kind of you know for each generation. Right. Elliot, sir, much yeah, appreciated, no, no, absolute you. pleasure. Yeah, thank pleasure. you.